Well, good morning, Booktube. It is a Monday morning here in West Michigan. It is 7.38 in the morning. It is March the 6th. And I'm sitting here in our dining room having a cup of coffee. I'm having my uh, morning divorce devotions. As I have said many times in my videos, that in the mornings I try to read, I try to read the Bible, or at least something that uh, points me to the Word of God. And uh, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, I have a bunch of books here, and what I'm going to do is that all these books I recommend for those who want some good Christian literature. Stuff to read in the mornings, stuff to look at or to, I don't know, stuff that I really have always found a blessing in my own life. Now, a book has been coming to my mind a lot lately and I finally went down in the lower level in our library and I got out last night and I want to mention this book. It's called The Wound of Knowledge by Roland Williams. Uh, I really recommend this book. Uh, if I could, I'd, I'd read this whole book to you. It is, it's, it's uh, just sets forth Christian spirituality and uh, I've had it for many years, since 1998 I bought it, and uh, it's called The Wound of Knowledge, A Theological History from the New Testament to Luther and St. John of the Cross by Rowan Williams. I, d I cannot rec stop, uh, I just highly recommend this book, The Wound of Knowledge. Another book I recommend is the Carthusian spirituality. Uh, you can see I, I put a special cover on this thing. I, I have a hardback edition. This is my paperback edition of this book. And I read it all the time. Uh, it, I just read it all the time and I cannot commend it too highly. Is that, does it, does that sound like, is, I highly commend this book or pick it up, buy it, read it. And it's the kind of book that you have to read your whole life because the Christian life is one of constant, well, should be constant growth and development, uh, spiritual growth. And so as you read this book, of course, like I always say, read the Bible, read the Word of God, all the time but this should be this is something to read all your whole life because as you go through your whole life spiritually speaking certain things will speak to you more than others as you read this book uh and so yeah i wanted to mention those books also uh, there is a series of books put out by um, the Sertertian publications <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh. I think I got some oatmeal stuck in my throat. I had oatmeal for breakfast this morning. Anyway, there's. I'm going to do a video. I've been thinking about doing a video on Sertertian Publications here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. They put out uh, Sertertian, which is a monastic order. Uh, most famous one is Bernard of Claveau, St. Bernard of Claveau. But they put out, uh, the, one thing about when you get into Christian spirituality and mystical theology, there's not that many books that are in English. And that's one thing that's kind of frustrating for me, that a lot of the books that I would like to read are in languages that I don't know, like in, uh, French or German or Spanish. And so when if you really get into 
monastic spirituality, medieval spirituality, <clears throat> Eastern Orthodox spirituality, there's not that many books in English that a person like me can buy and read. And to be honest, I have bought a lot of, if not most of what's out there in English, the good books. There are a lot of bad books or books that are not worth reading when it comes to what is called, quote, spirituality. But I'm always looking for good books, and I have bought many over the last, I'd say at least 30 years. And But the most consistent people who publish are Sertertians there in Kalamazoo. They put out all kinds of good books. And like I said, I want to do a video showing a sample of, of what Sertertian Publications puts out. But they, they put this book out. It's called The Wound of Love, a Carthasian Missionality, or Miss. I can't pronounce the word. Anyway, what it is, it's a. In the, the Carthusian order, you would have an abbot who, or an, an older monk who would stand up before the other monk brothers and they would give little talks about the spiritual life. And this is what this is these are little talks about given by uh, contemplative monastic monks in the Carthusian order and it's really good there's a couple of these uh, <coughs> books like this and I'll show those later <coughs> I cannot clear my throat as far as other things I've been reading um, I mentioned that the other day I went to Grand Rapids to pick up my wife and I stopped at a used bookstore it sells secular books. I stopped at a couple Christian books but I basically bought books at Erdman's and they're in Grand Rapids and I bought this book and I mentioned it in my couple videos back Canonical Theology of Biblical Canon Solar Scriptura Theological Method by John C. Peckham Peckham is Associate Professor of Theology and Christian Philosophy at Theological Seminary of Andrews University in Barron Springs, Michigan. He's a seven-day Adventist. I haven't really started getting into this, but I did read uh, last year or the year before his other book, The Love of God, A Canonical Approach by John C. Beckham. This is a, you know, I, I recommend this book um, give you food for thought. Another book I bought at Erdman's is that when I go to Erdman's, they they sell not only from the Protestant books, but they sell Eastern Orthodox books. And, and, and I always try to buy something in Eastern Orthodox. You have the Western Church and you have the Eastern Church. And I don't know why here in America or why the Western Church gets all the attention. Probably goes back to Augustine. But <clears throat> there are many great spiritual writers and Christians, men and women in the Eastern Orthodox who have written books over the centuries that are worth reading, and especially you can find translations. So I found this one, Light on the Mountain, Greek Patristic and Byzantine Homilies on the Transfiguration of the Lord, translated by Brian E. Daly. So I started reading this last night, looking, well, just reading the introduction to it. <clears throat> but a couple of years ago, I bought this book, and it's one of my favorite. It's been one of my favorite books. I pick it up every once in a while and reread it. It's, this is called "This Is My Beloved Son: The Transfiguration of Christ" by Andreas Andro Andre pa Papilus. Uh, this is really a great book, and uh, I dug it out last night because it kept coming to mind as I was reading this one. But I highly recommend this book. And then, like in the mornings, I'm still reading The Last Adam, a theological, a theology of the obedient life of Jesus in the Gospels of Brandon D. Crow. Uh, I'm still reading this, and uh, it's really a good book. It's, it's tinted by classical covenantal reform theology, but still worth reading. 
Still reading Sinaite and the Saints, reading Old Covenant Laws for New Covenant Community by James E. Todd III. This is, I'm enjoying this. This is a good book. And I got out this book, The Path of True Godliness by William Teklik. So, so the, he lived from 1579 to 1629. He was a Dutch Puritan when the Reformed. Uh, I just got this out to look at just basic Christian piety. And I'm still reading, I still have on my desk at least, The Christian's Only Comfort in Life and Death, an Exposition of the Heidelberg Catechism, Volume 1 by Theodore Vandergroove. And I started reading last night uh, this new book by Greg Keener. I have a lot of books by him. He's mostly commentaries. This is Spirit Hermeneutics, Reading Scripture in Light of Pentecost by Greg S. Keener. So these are kind of things I read in the mornings, throughout the week, throughout the month. Keep my mind on spiritual things. Because, you know, one thing, I, sometimes I hear things on the book nook that says that we're just like animals and that, like, you know, around here you see a lot of squirrels that are dead on the street. And someone just said them recently, I heard, that we're just like a dead squirrel on the street. When you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. There's nothing else. Well, I don't believe that. As a Christian, I believe that when I die, that I will go to be with the Lord in the new creation. That when I cease to live in this earthly world, that I will go to be with the Lord. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, yesterday my wife got a little text from a close friend of hers, and her, her close friend's father's died. And the, Carol's close friend text, my father now is in heaven. So to me, when someone says that we're just like a dead squirrel on the street, and that's all that life is, there's nothing else afterwards, I don't believe that. I believe as a Christian that when I die, that I will go to be with the Lord in heaven, in the new creation, and that there is the resurrection. It's like, for example, Easter is coming up. Now, I, Easter in our churches is called Resurrection Sunday. Easter is because we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Not only did he rose from the dead, but he ascended 40 days after. Now he's sitting upon the throne of God, and he's ruling the heavens and the earth. He is ascended. He is exalted. He is risen. And he is surrounded by, you know, innumerable angels and the saints of all ages worshiping and praising and adoring him right now as I am sitting here in this room. And that one day I will go to into that new creation and I will be around the throne of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ and I'll be worshiping Him forever and ever. That is what life is. I just don't... I'm not like that squirrel that just dies on the street and is run over by cars, and that's all that life is. I cease to exist. No, we don't all cease to exist when we... our bodies... No. It, that's not what... Uh, that's not the Christian hope. That's what the... The Christian has a heavenly hope. What? What, what, what is this life for? To prepare ourselves for that eternal state of glory, of being with Christ in heaven. That's what life is. I mean, why are we here on this earth? Just to gather material things that are just going to rot and rust and fall apart? No. We're to seek that crown of glory. We're to seek the, the riches of heaven. We're to seek the riches of Christ. And why do we do that? Well... It, you know, a verse came to my mind this morning, and it says here, Jesus says, in the, his, it's called his, uh, just, these are discourses in the Gospel of John, that he, speaking to his disciples as he looks to the cross where he's going to die on the cross for the sins of sinners. He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. He's going to the cross to die. But you will see me because I live, and you will live also. 
At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Reveal himself to him. There is a revelation of Christ by the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. And when you and that's why I read a couple of video go, videos ago about the, the loveliness of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the beauty of God. And that's what I'm saying that what what propels us, what motivates us? Why do we con continue to live out the Christian life? Why do we continue to live in this veil of tears? Why do we go through the things that we go through, sufferings and trials and difficulties, because we have seen Christ in His beauty. We have been, we have the wound of love. We have the wound of knowledge. We have been wounded by the love of Christ. We have been wounded by the revelation of the beauty of Christ. And we are smitten. And now we have this desire and this thirst. And we pursue after God. We run after God. And, and then we put down this, this physical body. And then we go into the eternal state. The Apostle Paul, he writes about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, uh, But someone will say, how are, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Do they come? Foolish ones, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that the body shall be, 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 shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it the body as he is pleased in each seed its own body. So also as a resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption, is raised in corruption, is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And that's what the Christian's hope is. We're just not like that squirrel out there in the street who's run over and that life ceased to exist. No, one day those who belong to Christ will bear his heavenly image and the new creation. And that's what I just want to talk about. It's been kind of on my mind, and I thought I'd just share that. So yeah, check out these books. Read the Word of God. Seek the face of God. Run the heavenly race. Repent of your sins. Put your faith in Christ. Walk in love. Experience the love of God. L live in His presence. Seek Him. Because, hey, life is running short. And when you're d once we die, then there's the day of judgment. There's no time for repentance. There's no time to seek God. And then we're going to have to bear the consequences of our decisions. Have we, have we given our life to Christ? Or have we just lived for ourselves in this fleeting world? So I just thought I'd share these things. Hope you have a good new week. Hope you, uh, if you got any questions, any, any thoughts, please feel to share. I'm just trying to be real here. I'm just, I don't like being plastic or phony. And I just wanted to bring these things out on my mind since I heard that comment about just being a dead squirrel. So until next time, hoping you have a good day and a new week. Bye.